Good morning, everyone, and welcome to the last quarterly call for the Rare Foundation Alliance of 2019. It's been a fantastic year, and we're so excited to um, end this year on a strong note and then get rested and well taken care of for 2020. So we're going to go ahead and get started for today. My name is Lada Sprocket, and I'm the program coordinator here at Global Genes. Um, for those of you who are new to the Rare Foundation Alliance, I'm the um, a program coordinator here who works primarily on the Foundation Alliance, Rare Foundation Alliance, with all of our educational um, efforts and resources, and always providing um, the best insight for our Rare Foundation Alliance organizations. And I'm super thankful to be part of this and be working with each and every one of you guys. I'm first going to go ahead and go over the agenda. So I'll be doing a little bit of an overview about Global Beans in just a few minutes here. And then one of our Rare Foundation Alliance Leadership Council members, Nathan, will be taking over and moderating the rest of the call for us. Then we'll have some event reminders um, talking or looking into 2020 on what Global Genes will be doing. And then um, Ashley will be talking about some educational programs and efforts um, here at Global Genes. And then we have a special presentation by Carrie um, from the NIH. And then we'll have a Q&A opportunity and then wrap up so that we are all ready for next year. So I always like to start these calls by, you know, putting, laying the foundation of why Global Genes does what we do. And um, our mission is to connect, empower, and inspire the rare disease community. And we do so by equipping the community um, with resources, educational materials, and events to eliminate the challenges of rare disease. And um, we are a team, um, small but mighty team who is um, thankful and appreciative to be serving a great community such as yourselves and in this particular instance, foundations who are here to serve the community as a whole. I now like to pass it off to um, Nathan Peck, who is the CEO of Cure BCP Disease and a Rear Foundation Alliance um, Leadership Council member. He's been an awesome asset to our team in, um, you know, always providing a great insight to Global Genes' efforts, and I will now pass it over to him. Thank you, Laudick. Can everybody hear me? Okay, I hope so. Well, happy holidays, Foundation Alliance members. Um, again, my name is Nathan Pack, as I said, CEO of Cure VCP Disease, a patient advocacy organization. Uh, we're headquartered in Americus, Georgia, and we're a two-year-old organization and driving efforts uh, to find a cure for diseases caused by the mutation of VCP gene, of which I'm a patient. It's an adult onset disease. So, we did want to just talk real quick. The, uh, I'm honored to be a member of the Foundation Alliance Leadership Council, uh, and we work directly with Global Genes to strategically advise on matters, you know, for the Foundation Alliance. And, you know, our goal is to identify and recommend Alliance goals and priorities, you know, representing all of you organizations out there. Um, and, and, you know, the interesting thing about our group is we have a, a, you know, a mix of experience as well as new leadership organizations you know, such as mine, which is, is relatively new, but we have a lot of experience as well. And, you know, that diversity is important for ensuring that we represent and support all the Foundation Alliance members out there. And one of those outcomes was the Foundation Alliance meeting that was at the conclusion of the Global Genes Patient Advocacy Summit in San Diego this past September. So that was a, and we'll talk a little bit more about that in a little bit. All right, so in terms of the uh, updates, um, you know, for all Foundation Alliance members, we need your updated contact info. So please make sure you go to the, the hub, the, the rare portal, and update your info. Um, and if you don't update it, Global Genes will come after you. So they'll be looking for your, your contact info. But again, please, um, you know, there's also a networking portion of that where you can connect with other Foundation Alliance members as well as other Global Genes members and participants. Um, and so that's a real useful asset. And, you know, we would also highly encourage you to take advantage. You know, Loud already mentioned the, the resource hub, um, but there's a lot of recordings from the different sessions, especially for the new members. Um, there's a lot of assets, a lot of uh, white papers uh, that can be useful to your organization. So take advantage of that. 
We do want to welcome all the new members. I'm not going to go through and, and introduce, but it's a tremendous list. We actually have another slide for this, but um, you know, we have over six, uh, Global Genes now has 600 foundational, over 600 foundational alliance member organizations. And I can say that you've joined a wonderful organization and one that has provided my organization, you know, awesome support, networking, and encouragement, you know, to keep striving. I, you know, and personally, I can say, it, you know, this organization helped change my life in terms of patient advocacy. So here's another slide of new members. So again, um, we are thankful, to, you know, to have a community of leaders that come together to share best practices, and welcome to all the new members. All right, one of the, uh, we hope, you know, for the current, you know, the uh, Foundation Alliance members that were at the Patient Advocacy Summit in September, we hope that you're able to participate in the Foundation Alliance meeting that was on the conclusion. It was on a Saturday morning, everyone was fatigued from an action-packed summit, but uh, over 100 Foundation Alliance member organization leaders came together to discuss social media, research collaboration, life stages of organizations, registries and data and grant writing. And it was a really valuable time um, to get together. I know we got a lot out of it and the feedback that shared on this slide was just some of the, uh, the positive feedback. So um, you know, we, we wanted to share that with you, but also uh, we are planning to do something similar at the 2020 conference. And if you have any feedback um, beyond the survey that was already sent out or, you know, feel free to reach out to myself or the Global Genes, Lauda, the, the Global Genes organization, um, you know, on what topics you would like to hear or discuss, but uh, we are planning to do that again. So make, you know, in terms of travel plans, we'll provide more information at that time. All right, and with that, I think I'm going to pass it back to Lauda. Yes, thank you so much, Nathan. And I must say, I'm, I'm pretty impressed with the pronunciation of the name today. Um, you've done a great job there. Thank you, thank so, you. Uh, <laughs> so, um, as Nathan mentioned, we did have our first ever in-person meeting for the Rear Foundation Alliance at our summit, and we had a great turnout, and it was a great experience for us all. And you know, based on the feedback that we did receive, we hope to do that again next year. And so I just wanted to touch base a little bit about our Rear Patient Advocacy Summit as a whole and, you know, how it went this year and what um, events we're planning on doing next year. Um, I hope that out of everybody who's attend, um, on this call right now, the majority of you guys were able to attend with um, in person and if not by in person that you were able to attend via live stream. Um, we did have a great turnout. We had um, over a thousand people registered for our summit this year. So it was amazing to see we were in a new space in San Diego and we had some new friendly faces and new exhibitors. It was overall a really great experience. Um, for those of you, if you were unable to make it, we do have some um, various ways that in which you can connect with us um, to kind of get yourself caught up or educated if you're so interested. We do have our session recordings available on our resource hub. And um, after this call, this um, slide deck will be available to you. So you can kind of, you can click out to the link that I've provided there. And all of our session recordings from every single session at our summit are available. And we highly encourage you to take, um, you know, peek around the agenda and access any of those that are of interest to you. And we do pride ourselves in selecting very um, interested and engaged speakers as well. So if you are interested in you know, doing some follow-up with any of those speakers, feel free to let me know and we can try to make that um, connection and bridge the gap there. Global Genes also did um, do a session and um, released a new um, article about next, the imagining the future of rare disease. And um, in this booklet, we, which is downloadable on our website, we um, interviewed and um, reached out to several different people in various spaces in the rare disease community to see, you know, where the rare disease community has been in the past years and also where it's going. Um, so if you're interested in reading that, that is also available on our website. Um, we have some phenomenal speakers who are amazing authors as well. So if you are an avid reader, you feel free to read um, Chasing My Cure by Dr. David Fagenbaum and Brain on Fire from Susanna. She was a keynote speaker and uh, did an awesome and inspiring job for us all going forward. 
So, like I said, these were all will all be available um, after the call and going forward. And these are just some ways that you can engage with us. But um, if there's anything you have questions about about this summit, if you were unable to attend, or even if you did, always feel free to follow up with the Global Genius team, and we'd be happy to connect you wherever possible. Now, I'd like to talk a little bit about um, where Global, Gene, Global Gene's plans are for 2020. And um, I'd like to first preface this by, uh, this is not to say that other events may not be added and that some dates and times may or may not be changed. But for the most part, this is our events calendar for 2020. Um, we have Rare in the Square in San Francisco. Um, in January, and we receive a lot of questions about Rare in the Square and whether or not this is an, you know, an appropriate place for Foundation Alliance members um, to be in attendance. Um, this is done in the conjunction with the J.P. Morgan Healthcare Conference, and so we, while we do, um, you know, anybody is welcome. We do encourage that. Um, the foundations that are in attendance are those that feel that they are at that point in time where they're looking for investors for um, their uh, rare disease community. And if you have any questions, feel free to send me an email regarding that. Um, one thing to take note of is that San Francisco during the JP Morgan Healthcare Conference is very costly. So um, you um, might want to think about whether or not the, the return will be useful to your community. Um, next, we have our data DIY. This is the fourth of the series. It's becoming a data-centric community. There are travel scholarships available for this event. Um, you can find more information on our events hub. We have our Rare Entrepreneur Boot Camp, which um, my colleague Maureen will go into more detail about in just a little bit. Our Rare Drug Development Symposium is going to be taking place in Philadelphia again this year in conjunction with the Orphan Disease Center of the University of Pennsylvania and the Million Dollar Bike Ride. And then our most common or known event is a Rare Patient Advocacy Summit, once again taking place in San Diego um, from September 21st to the 23rd. And we hope to do more um, networking and, of course, that event for Foundation Alliance members exclusively. If you have any more questions or um, you know, want to find out more details about any of these events that I've mentioned, please feel free to go to our events hub. Um, I've listed the link there. I did want to take note that our events hub is a place for all community members to participate. And while we do have Global Genes um, events listed on there, we highly encourage each and individual each and every individual foundation to go on there and post their events and take a look about what events are happening near or around you. Um, we highly encourage these community events to be posted. And um, it's a great way to kind of see what else is going on in the rare disease community. Lauda, just real quick, those are 2020 dates. They say 2019. Oh my gosh. Yeah, thank you so much, Nathan. Yes, those are 2020 days. <laughs> that was a comment. You. I'm not taking credit. That was somebody's uh, Q&A. Thank you. Thank you so much. <laughs> and now I'm going to pass it over to my colleague, Maureen, to talk a little bit more about the Rare Entrepreneur Boot Camp. Hi, everybody. Good morning. Uh, and so I just wanted to take a, a little bit of an opportunity to talk about a program that we have. Um, we've been running it for a couple of years now, and it is a partnership with um, Ultragenics. Uh, and uh, we call it our Rare Entrepreneur Boot Camp. And it is designed for um, advocacy organizations who have been actively funding rare disease research and are either thinking about, uh, beginning to contemplate, or actively starting to uh, move the research that they have funded into um, uh, either a company or perhaps trying to think about moving it forward as a venture philanthropist. So the, the information that you receive there is really, really focused on how, as a, an advocacy group, uh, you might be able to think about moving research on uh, a particular therapeutic for your community as a for-profit company. It is an absolutely wonderful event. Um, this one in February, that will be um, February 19th 
through the 21st, and it will be held up at um, the headquarters of Ultragenics in Novato, California, which is just a little bit north of um, San Francisco. It's about an hour north of San Francisco. Uh, it is a, a wonderful opportunity. They, um, we bring in speakers ranging from uh, folks from legal teams to venture capitalists uh, to a lot of people at Ultragenics to talk through some of the um, efforts needed on the preclinical side and in clinical development. Um, it, it, the, the people who have attended speak incredibly highly of it and all that they've learned. Uh, and as, as I said, it is um, really, it's, a, it's an event not to be missed if you are at this stage and really thinking about it, it might be a way for your community to advance uh, drug development for um, your disease. So uh, please take a look at this. And if you think you can answer these questions uh, affirmatively, please get in touch with me. Uh, there is an application that we ask for in advance, and it is um, deliberately designed to be small. So we're really only looking for perhaps about 15 people or so to attend because we, we want to keep this small for really uh, in-depth mentoring opportunities. So again, if interested, please reach out to me uh, at the email there, reb at globalgenes.org. Um, and we're, we'd be very excited to talk about it with you. And uh, I think now I'm going to turn it over to Ashley from our team to talk a little bit more uh, about some other events that are going on or some other opportunities that are going on at Global Genes. Hi, everyone. Um, thanks, Maureen, for passing over to me. Um, I'm just going to go over a couple programs that we have coming up um, for everyone to, to know about. So the first is that we are um, asking if everyone wants to save the date for January 23rd. We'll be hosting our first webinar of the year 2020, and it will be on establishing an awareness day. Um, this will be a really <laughs> this will be a really great webinar. Um, and we're really excited to be able to bring this to you, and I think it'll be a really great ramp up for as we start to all prepare for World Rare Disease Day. Um, and so this is going to be a great ask if this is something that you have wanted to pursue as an organization or as a patient. Um, we're really excited also to be bringing on three really wonderful panelists. Um, where we'll have a patient advocate who had um, received, who had been able to confirm a state awareness day for his disease um, all on his own. We'll also be having a panelist representing a foundation who was able to get a national awareness day approved. And we'll also be having a staffer from one of our own California state legislators who will help us talk about what the process looks like in getting a official awareness day approved either on the national level or the state level, or also if you want to consider a governor's proclamation in your own local area, um, so she's going to be able to provide kind of the ins and outs and process of how that's going to look. So we really encourage you to be on the lookout. Um, we'll also be starting our new webinar platform on 24. So unfortunately, we won't be on WebEx anymore, but it'll be also a new way to engage all of you while you join us on our webinar. So definitely save that date, January 23rd. Um, and it'll, of course, be recorded if you can't join us, but still register just so that we can make sure we get those notifications out to you when it is ready on our recording found in our resource hub. Um, I also wanted to just really mention our Rare Compassion Project. Uh, and many of you may already know about this program, but it is our program that helps um, match families and patients with medical students from all over our country. And as you can see, we support the U.S., the U.K., and Canada. And so we're always looking, of course, to recruit more and more um, students. We are up to, I think, almost 200 students who have currently participated. And we're definitely looking to add more to that list for the year 2020. But we could really use everyone's help. Um, we definitely need more patients and families to participate. Uh, when we get really big call outs from certain schools, we really do receive um, we do need more families in some of the areas. In particular for this call, if anyone has families in the Ohio region and would like to share this program with them, it's a really great way for families to get started on sharing their story and really helping edu educate young medical students um, as part of their educational experience and to be more equipped and prepared to see rare disease patients and families. So while we're looking for families all over our country and across the three different um, countries, Specifically, if you have families in Ohio, we would love to get them involved in this program. We have a bunch of Ohio medical students waiting to be matched right now. 
Um, we've been really pushing this program the last couple of years, and we've had over 2,000 patients apply, um, but only 400 students um, have we've been able to get participating. But again, we're trying to grow that program, and hopefully we can get schools in every single state across the U.S. and all the provinces of Canada. So again, we're really looking for everyone's help. Um, I didn't put them on here, but just kind of a couple quotes to really emphasize how how helpful this has been. Um, one of our participants had said uh, that when they told their provider their story, she reacted with sympathy and kindness, and she emphasized that her words were compelling. It felt good to be heard and validated. And so these are really some of the testimonies that we hear from patients who get to be matched and have this experience. So again, we really hope that you'll all um, consider this program and share with your communities. If you need or want, or if you want to or need to share this program, um, you can go ahead and email uh, myself or Lada, and we can give you some uh, flyers and some information to help share it with your community. Again, we hope you'll be able to participate. We're really looking to grow this program, and we think it's a great opportunity for everyone. Okay, well, I'll go ahead and uh, introduce our special presentation today. I want to welcome Dr. Carrie Willenetz. Carrie is Acting Chief of Staff and Associate Director for Science Policy at the National Institute of Health. As a leader there, she advises the NIH Director on science policy matters of significance to the agency, the research community, and the public on a wide range of issues, including human subject protections, biosecurity, biosafety, genomic data sharing, regenerative medicine, the organization and management of NIH, and the outputs and values of NIH-funded research. She's been in that role since 2015. And Carrie has a BS in animal science from Cornell University and received her PhD in animal science from Pennsylvania State University, where her area of research was reproductive physiology. Carrie, welcome to Global Genes, and we look forward to your presentation. Thank you. Thank you. I'm really delighted to be here. I really appreciate the invitation. Wanted to talk a little bit today about um, some of the hottest science uh, in terms of addressing rare diseases and other genetically based diseases through gene therapy and gene editing specifically and talk about um, some of the hot topics within that space. So many of you have probably heard of gene editing or the most recent gene editing tool, CRISPR. It's been making a lot of headline news, particularly relevant to its application for providing real curative solutions potentially for um, diseases with a genetic basis. And of course, a lot of rare diseases fall into that category and our um, prospects for using this approach as a therapy. Um, I think it is important uh, just to set the stage a little bit about where CRISPR, which suddenly seems to be everywhere, you know, on the cover of all the magazines and, and in a lot of newspapers, um, where it fits in kind of the arc of, of discovery and science. Um, gene editing, the concept of adding or subtracting or replacing DNA, um, is, is not a new concept, so there have been older gene therapy um, uh, techniques around for a long time, in particular um, using viruses to convey pieces of DNA to help fix genetic basis of disease. Um, that's, and I'll talk more about that in a bit. Um, that's, uh, that's sort of an older technology, but even gene editing, um, and I'll tell you a little bit about uh, what that means exactly. Um, those technologies have been around for a little while. We see some older technologies like zinc finger nuclei and talons and omega-nucleases. I'm not going to get into the details of how those work, um, but I will say that uh, uh, we have some experience with those, and CRISPR um, is sort of the new kid on the block of uh, gene editing tools. Um, and CRISPR actually was discovered through basic foundational research into the immune systems of naturally occurring bacteria. Um, but it turns out that when paired with an enzyme um, called Cas9, uh, this can be a really powerful tool to make very precise edits in uh, genetic material in, in DNA and RNA. And essentially, this works almost like the find and replace feature on your word processor. So um, uh, CRISPR-Cas9 can locate um, particular genes and then make uh, very precise cuts or edits um, at, at sort of the um, 
uh, single nucleotide level. So if you think of the of DNA and those uh, those letters that you often see it portrayed in the A, T, Cs, and Gs, it can actually remove a T and replace it with an A. Um, and so it can remove genes, it can fix genes, um, uh, and and really um, has a great deal of power um, to edit the the human genome. Um, what makes CRISPR especially exciting over sort of previous technologies is that it is um, far more precise, so it's easier to use. It has the potential um, to make very exacting edits in a way that uh, previous technologies were just clunkier uh, in, in doing that. It can also edit the genome at multiple spots, um, so for diseases that have um, uh, multiple genetic causes or uh, uh, pathologies where you've got more than one gene involved, um, there is the potential to edit more than one gene at once, which is something that older technologies were really not able to do. So a lot of exciting um, uh, scientific potential here, which is why there's a lot of fuss about it, why you're suddenly hearing about um, uh, CRISPR everywhere. And the other thing that is worth noting is that CRISPR, the CRISPR-Cas system, um, actually has a lot of different applications um, in the research space. There are other clinical applications, um, like creating another generation of antimicrobials. Um, it allows us to create really interesting animal models for research. Um, you may have heard of the technology of gene drives um, in which CRISPR is used to edit the genomes of mosquitoes so that they can no longer carry diseases like malaria. That's also been in the news quite a bit. Um, but what I'm really going to focus on today is the prospect of um, CRISPR for um, uh, gene editing, both for human gene therapy, so this is sometimes called somatic cell gene therapy, it's non-heritable, um, as well as the uh, uh, concept of heritable gene editing, which is another thing that you're seeing a lot in the um, news and is frequently mentioned in, in the sort of rare disease therapy space. Um, so just to, again, level set uh, and make sure everybody's got uh, 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 their thinking caps on in terms of, of the vocabulary and what we're talking about, because this is something I see scientists actually um, uh, get a little clumsy about and get wrong, is when you think of gene editing technologies, that's sort of like a toolbox, a big toolbox um, uh, that actually refers to a lot of different methods. So if you think of gene editing technology as sort of a toolbox, within that there are a lot of different kinds of screwdrivers. There are Phillips heads, there are flat heads, there are electric screwdrivers, and CRISPR is one of those tools in the toolbox. It's sort of the fancy version of the electric screwdriver, the one that's cordless and, and um, has a lot of attachments but it's um, not tremendously different in many ways from, from previous uh, uh, technologies. Um, and it's important to note that, that those technologies, and CRISPR in particular, has a lot of different applications. And so when you're talking about gene editing and you're talking about CRISPR and you're talking about the application of, uh, of CRISPR, like heritable gene editing or gene therapy or gene drives, those are not synonymous terms. And so we have to be really careful when we're talking about it. And one of the reasons we have to be careful is because if you're thinking about policies or regulation or support of research, we want to make sure we're supporting the appropriate application, not necessarily the tool itself. Um, so uh, as I mentioned, gene editing uh, is a tool that can be used for gene therapy, and gene therapy is just a uh, concept of actually fixing the genetic cause of a disease in, in a number of ways by modifying the genes. As I mentioned, um, we've had gene therapies around for a number of decades now, um, mostly using uh, uh, inactivated viruses as vectors in order to uh, carry um, that uh, uh, replacement DNA or RNA into the system. Um, gene editing uh, uh, technologies are the latest tool for gene therapy, and uh, there are already a lot of clinical trials going on using these tools. Um, zinc finger nucleases, for example, um, are being used to try to correct Hunter syndrome to make human cells resistant to HIV. Um, we're seeing talons, which is another older uh, gene editing technology, being used to create um, universal CAR T cells, so this is a cancer therapy approach. 
Um, and then uh, CRISPR uh, has uh, exploded with great potential to uh, uh, treat a number of, um, of uh, diseases, and sickle cell disease is certainly see, uh, something we at NIH see as uh, being a, a near-term prospect. Um, but this is a versatile enough tool that it's being discussed in a lot of contexts. There are clinical trials going on for retinal disorders and cancer as well, and uh, we're likely only going to see those numbers go up and up. Uh, so. Uh, just to, to focus a couple of um, initiatives that NIH is investing a, a lot in right now, as I mentioned, um, we're quite interested in sickle cell disease as a um, near-term target. We already are now um, seeing the beginnings of curative therapies for sickle cell disease using some of these older gene therapy technologies, but we see CRISPR as having great potential um, for, for doing this even faster and better, and in particular, in particular, um, uh, right now, a lot of gene therapies involving these tools are what we call ex vivo. So that means you have to take cells outside the body, something like bone marrow cells, for example, fix them and the, using these gene editing technologies and put them back into the patients. And that's pretty intensive. It requires a lot of expertise, a, a very big hospital infrastructure. The, the um, holy grail of using these gene editing technologies is what we call in vivo editing. That means in the body. So that would involve essentially um, finding some way to uh, give the patient this editing technology directly um, and uh, allowing it to do its thing and, and, and fix the, the disease. And this is particularly relevant to sickle cell disease because um, uh, a lot of the burden of disease is, are in places like sub-Saharan Africa, which might not have the infrastructure to support the more intensive types of um, uh, in vivo gene therapy. So an uh, ex vivo solution is really the only feasible idea. But that is, um, that is many, many years down the road. However, um, the versatility of of the CRISPR-Cas9 system allows us to begin imagining that's possible. Um, the other big area in which NIH is investing that is, um, I think, probably of particular interest to the rare disease community is investing in gene editing as a platform technology. So we're trying to solve universally some of the solutions that are not disease specific to this technology, um, but really could be universally applied to a lot of different uh, diseases. So the idea of perfecting the technology um, in a way that just allows you to to sort of change the, the target, so, you know, using that word processor uh, analogy, changing the, you know, the finds of, uh, feature um, uh, and the replace feature uh, just by changing the word, essentially, um, and, and getting to the point where these are really um, kind of plug and, and play technology. So we're investing a lot of money to try to work on the tools themselves in a disease agnostic way. Um, and uh, uh, as I mentioned, uh, we uh, are very interested in this uh, notion of, um, of uh, ex vivo um, uh, gene editing, and we've recently announced a partnership with the Gates Foundation to move that forward. Um, so it is important, uh, you know, a, a, in addition to all of these um, uh, kind of hot new gene editing, uh, to put that in the context of the fact that we are sort of reaching finally at long last kind of a golden age of gene therapy in that we are now seeing um, the first gene therapy um, uh, treatments being approved by the FDA and out on the street, and it's given this really great sense of excitement and hope um, that finally, after many years of talking about this hypothetically, we're at the point where maybe we can come up with genetic treatment genetic-based treatments uh, for diseases, and, um, uh, and that's certainly something here at NIH we're very, very excited about. Um, but I think it is also important to give a, a dose of reality with that. Um, I, the, um, you know, sickle cell disease is an interesting example because it's a really good um, uh, illustration of how long um, these journeys can be. You know, sickle cell disease was one of the first uh, diseases characterized at a, at a molecular level, one of the first diseases we figured out the cause for. In 1910, um, the, the gene for sickle cell disease was discovered in 1957, and this is a pretty 
simple disease from a genetic point of view in that it um, involves a, a mutation of, of one gene. And only now are we really beginning to see successful curative gene therapy approaches for sickle cell disease. So it's been a really long time coming. Now, that serves as a model and a proof of concept for other diseases. Um, so there'll be some acceleration, but uh, in terms of timeline, um, it's, it is important to keep in mind that as exciting um, and uh, uh, promising as these technologies are, uh, it's not always a, a short road. And, and part of that um, specific to gene editing tools like CRISPR is there are still a lot of scientific challenges to overcome. Um, delivery system, so figuring out how to get the um, gene editing tool to the right part of the body is really important. You don't want, a, you know, you don't want a, a, a pair of genetic scissors running rampant in the wrong tissues um, if you're really trying to um, uh, put forward an effective therapy for a disease that has a particular effect in, say, the liver or the kidney. Um, and also, uh, to that point, we worry a lot about off-target effects. So not just um, editing the gene of interest, but editing potentially parts of the genome as, uh, uh, as well that are not actually related to the disease. We want to make sure that we are not jumping out of the frying pan into the fire by fixing one gene but um, uh, breaking another one. So uh, that's something that is uh, a scientific challenge that we are working on uh, making progress uh, towards. And all of these, of course, um, uh, relate to safety. We want to make sure that uh, any product that's coming out of this um, gene editing technology is uh, is very safe um, and and effective. Um, and so uh, that's a good transition, actually, to talk a little bit um, about a, a, another application of this technology, which is not somatic gene therapy. So your body basically has two kinds of cells. There's somatic cells, um, which are uh, non-heritable. They, they belong to you. Um, uh, and then there are um, germline cells or heritable cells. And so these are things like um, uh, sperm, eggs, and embryos. Uh, and most of the time when we're talking about gene therapy, we're talking about therapy on a patient who already has a disease, and that involves somatic cell gene therapy. So that's not heritable. It's, it's, it's limited to the um, individual who is receiving that treatment. Um, but CRISPR has raised the possibility of um, uh, potentially uh, uh, using this technology for heritable forms of gene therapy. So this is correcting the disease at the level of the sperm, egg, or embryo. Um, I should note, uh, since I'm speaking from the National Institutes of Health, um, the NIH does not fund this sort of research. We don't fund any research involving gene editing technology in human embryos. Um, uh, that's in part uh, because uh, we are statutorily prohibited from uh, funding research involving human embryos, um, but also because we have um, some serious concerns about uh, premature use of, of this technology. Um, and I just want to dive in a little bit on that because I think it's, it's also, again, important to see this in the context of the potential hope of this technology and, and what might be um, uh, hype as well. So what are the things we think of when we think of this heritable gene editing um, technology? Uh, so uh, safety, of course, is always first and, and foremost. Um, uh, the consequences of um, potentially editing genes um, that you did not intend to edit or uh, where the effects of that might not show up uh, until farther down the road. You don't want to cure one disease and introduce another one um, and not have awareness of that. So that's a, that's a pretty serious safety issue. Um, and the risk-benefit scenario is going to be very different. Um, when you're talking about embryos versus um, uh, living living patients. Um, uh, the the medical need um, is a is a really good question. Uh, this this question of whether there are needs that only heritable gene editing could meet. Um, in order for this to work, practically speaking, you're going to have to um, involve in vitro fertilization, um, an editing technology, and then pre-implantation genetic diagnosis. So the idea of taking a cell from the embryo and and checking it to make sure that um, in fact that embryo uh, does not have the disease that you're looking for. Um, 
And uh, uh, if you're going to do that, you could actually potentially just choose um, healthy embryos. It's not a model that works for every disease, but it works for the vast majority of them. And so um, it, it, whether or not um, the, the medical need is really there um, is a good question. Arguably, this technology is really about um, reproductive choices uh, for uh, those who are um, who couples who are carriers of um, rare genetic diseases or, or even common genetic diseases. Um, and uh, I speak as someone who uh, my husband and I are carriers of a rare genetic disease. Um, uh, it is about furthering reproductive choices, so essentially allowing couples to potentially edit uh, uh, that gene out of, um, out of an embryo. And so that is a, uh, a risk-benefit sort of question um, that is important to think about. Uh, and then, uh, you know, there are a lot of um, sort of ethical issues here because, because this is heritable editing, it doesn't just affect the um, uh, the embryo being edited, where that embryo to uh, uh, be implanted and become a child to themselves reproduces, um, then those edits, uh, whatever they are, are going to be passed into the sort of broader gene pool um, in a way that, that doesn't happen with most uh, somatic gene therapies. So um, that has potentially big, bigger consequences from a population uh, point of view, which raises some unique ethical issues. Issues. Um, and then uh, getting back to safety and, and how do we how do we wrestle with all of these questions? Um, we don't really have good uh, governance systems in place in many countries um, to uh, deal with these particular issues. Um, so there's a real question of whether or not our um, global governance and regulatory systems are ready for this technology. And in fact, we've already seen um, this arise uh, uh, last year. There was sort of a, a very shocking announcement out of China that a scientist, Junkui He, had used this technology to edit embryos. Um, and there was a lot of evidence that the regulatory system and the, the ethical oversight system in China was, was not ready for that. It raised a huge number of um, uh, concerns and sort of a huge international outcry and pushback from the, the um, uh, scientific community and the medical community and, and really the public at large. And so um, there are a lot lot of questions that need to be answered before the heritable form of this technology um, can really be moved uh, forward. Uh, but I do want to end on a, on a high note. Uh, it sounded a little gloomy at the end there because, um, uh, truthfully, um, uh, the, the potential for genetic solutions and, and uh, using some of these newer gene editing tools for diseases um, has never been brighter. Um, it is a matter, though, of making sure we have all of our I's dotted and T's crossed on uh, uh, doing this as um, safely and as evidence-based way as, as possible. Um, but certainly, uh, we at NIH are, are quite excited about the, um, the hope imbued in, in these technologies and its potential for really uh, treating a, a number of diseases that didn't really have that, um, that hope in the past. So um, I'll end there and happy to take whatever questions you have. All right. Thank you, Dr. Wolinitz. We really appreciate that. That was, uh, love that quote at the end. And, and certainly, the, uh, I know I deal with our, in our patient population, they think CRISPR is the solution to everything. So I appreciate you highlighting and articulating, you know, that it's just a tool. Uh, all right, we do have a Q&A box. Um, and I don't remember, Lauda, if we were opening it up for questions over the phone. Or... Yep, okay. of course. So anybody at this time, if you have any questions, feel free to put them in the Q&A um, chat function. Um, we did get a few questions coming in on our end. Um, the question is for Carrie, how long does it take once the disease is identified to have gene editing up? That's a, that is a, um, a, a great question, and the really unsatisfying answer is a little bit, it depends. Um, it depends for a number of reasons. One, it depends on um, how complex the uh, um, the cause of the disease is. So, you know, the sort of um, simplest uh, uh, from a genetic point of view um, cause of a disease is if you have 
a single gene where there's some sort of mutation and that is well understood, well understood what the potential mutations are, um, well understood what the effect of that is. So what is that actually doing in the body to cause the disease? Um, uh, you know, the, what is the product of that, that gene um, uh, doing? Um, and uh, in that case, um, uh, now, potentially, the timeline between identifying that gene um, and, and coming up with a, um, a, a, a potential solution to it can be quite can be quite quick. The challenge then comes on um, uh, making sure that your solution is able to be delivered to the right tissue at the right time in a way that um, uh, can actually uh, fix that gene. And that can be um, uh, quite variable in how complicated it is. Um, we're very good at getting at some tissues, not very good at getting at others. Um, and so, so the timeline can be um, uh, uh, can be quite long, um, as in uh, you know decades potentially, which uh, which is frustrating. But it, that is that is changing, getting shorter and shorter all the time. Um, and this is where I think you know. Um, Patient advocacy groups can play a, a real role and do already play a real role in the sense of, you know, one of the um, uh, slowdowns that occurs in the research process is getting enough volunteers for clinical trials um, um, of these approaches. And, and when um, patient advocacy groups, you know, form registries or, or lists or, or, or can help um, uh, connect with the research community to identify um, that potential population of, of volunteers, that can be incredibly um, helpful. Great, thank you, Carrie. Uh, we also got another question regarding funding. It says, we are trying to get a genome-wide association study completed and ideas for funding. Uh, I, I'm sorry, the question was, uh, you're trying to get a genome-wide association study uh, uh, completed and, and what about funding? Um, are there, do you have any ideas for funding? Um, well, I it certainly, um, I, you know, it's I, I, in some cases, depending, I, you know, without getting into the specifics, um, I, it might be appropriate to come to NIH for funding. Um, we do uh, we do fund some uh, still some GWAS studies. Um, uh, there are uh, uh, certainly um, private philanthropists who uh, who um, fund that work. Um, uh, it's uh, yeah. There's there's a wide range of uh, funding possibilities, um, but I will say also, you know, uh, uh, as our technology gets better and the ability to do these studies um, uh, accelerates, um, there's also a much greater demand, and so kind of a lag time in both the funding and the infrastructure to be able to do that. Great, thank you so much. I'm trying to stay on it to see if there are any other questions. Hold on just one second. One of the questions that we did receive is, if these treatments are available, how much would it cost for a patient? Um, that is a great question, um, and you know, uh, speaking for our NIH, we of course don't um, uh, set the prices of these. Um, uh, what we have seen on the market um, so far is uh, uh, very high price tags on these kind of curative gene therapies, um, uh, and uh, I think the the market, um, and I, I you know mean that in the broadest possible sense of the word, all of the payers like the Center for Medicare and Medicaid Services and private insurers are still, I think, struggling with figuring out um, what is appropriate um, pricing 
for these kinds of therapies and how you how you cover them um, because what we've seen so far are these these very high price tags. Um, NIH is an agency who's really involved in sort of the more fundamental and basic uh, research. We don't we don't develop the therapies. Um, uh, that is that is something we're not involved with. But I think certainly one of the conversations that's happening broadly in the community that is particularly relevant to the rare disease community, especially the ultra rare disease community, is um, how do you deal with things for which there are uh, there, there isn't a market because everyone who has the disease might be involved in the clinical trial to develop the therapy. Um, that is something I, I think um, uh, we as a as sort of a country, as a, as a research community have not figured out yet, um, but it'll be really important to have um, uh, patient and participate voices in that conversation because, um, uh, you know, as these technologies are accelerating and there's a real interest in access to them, um, uh, you know, how do you deal with these diseases where the everyone who has it might be involved in the clinical trial, um, get the, you know, get the potential therapy, and then there isn't a market anymore because you've received a potentially curative therapy. Um, that is a that is a really thorny issue to to try to wrestle with in our current system. Thank you so much. Um, we have another one that just came through. Um, with all the hype around gene therapy, is there a danger that small molecule approaches for rare disease will get lost in the shuffle? These are often cheaper and easier. Yeah, that is a great uh, that is a great question, and I think you know it's really important um, to uh, to really look hard at 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 where the science is currently. If you are, you know, if you look at something like um, the recent announcement for uh, the triple therapy for cystic fibrosis, you know, when my boss, Francis Collins, um, uh, first helped discover the cystic fibrosis gene, they really thought that was the beginning of an avenue towards um, uh, gene therapy. And it turns out, you know, these many years later, um, that, that wasn't the ultimate solution. And so I think it's really important to every step of the way evaluate what is the most likely prospect um, uh, to provide treatment for uh, uh, patients in the real world and um, if there are, if you're far, far away from the prospect of a small molecule uh, therapy, then then maybe the the gene editing, gene therapy solution is the one really worth pursuing. But if you've got some promising things in the pipeline, um, then uh, that's probably the the way to go. And I do think we have to be very careful um, as part of uh, controlling the hype and reality checking, not looking at gene editing as kind of the magical solution to all genetic genetically based diseases because um, it could be that there are simpler, cheaper, uh, nearer term solutions uh, in the pipeline. Thank you so much. And we have one last question that came through before we wrap up. It says, I heard that treatments like this are available, that you only have one chance at it, and that if you're an ideal candidate, or, but sorry, <laughs> I heard that there's only one chance available um, for this, and it, it's only if you're an ideal candidate. Is there any truth to that, or, or could you explain any further about that? Um, no, I think that's too sort of broad a, a, a statement. I mean, it's going to, uh, you know, whether or not um, you're an ideal candidate for a clinical trial of any therapy, whether it's gene-based or otherwise, um, is going to be very much related to the type of disease, the design of the trial, um, and uh, whether or not, um, uh, you know, how far along the pathway the, the, the development of the, the therapy is. Um, but certainly, um, I, you know, there's, there's not a kind of uh, necessarily a single bite at the apple for any potential clinical trial. They're iterative, um, uh, you know, sorts of sorts of processes, um, and so uh, it's it's. I think um, 
uh, too strong to say that there's like, you know, one one bite at the apple and, uh, and then you're done. Um, it's going to be very much related to, um, uh, you know, how far along the, the um, gene therapy is, you know, what, what kind of trial it is, how many people there are um, uh, who could potentially benefit from it, and, and how complicated the therapy itself is. Um, I, I think there is, um, uh, uh, you know, a range of possibilities. Great, thank you so much, Carrie. And um, we're going to go ahead and, oh, we have one more question that just came through. Okay. Um, has the CRISPR case nine efficiency been improved? Yes, um, so, so yeah, I think, you know, even as we speak, sit here speaking, talking on the phone, um, there are um, uh, legions of scientists all over the world working at both a very sort of fundamental, basic, you know, technology improvement level to improve CRISPR-Cas9 all the way up to, um, uh, you know, clinical trials going on using this, this technology. And so, um, uh, every day something new is discovered, and, you know, as with any um, sort of discovery process, um, sometimes that's, you know, two steps forward, sometimes it's one step back, um, and it is a, you know, it's an incremental process, but there is, um, uh, you know, we've, we've learned a lot um, to the point where, you know, we are starting to see this going into um, clinical trials in a very rapid, you know, relative to other technologies, um, that's happened very quickly um, uh, and so yes we are we are learning more every day it's getting better every day but but as with any sort of research discovery process um, uh, you know there's there's likely to be both um, forward and and backward um, uh, progress and and uh, in terms of efficiency in terms of what we discover about safety and effectiveness and um, uh, you know we're, we're going to have to work our way through those um, uh, sort of one step at a time Great. Thank you so, so much, Carrie. And now I'm going to go ahead and leave it to Nathan to finish us off for this call. No, we, um, yeah, so the next call is uh, March 11th. You can see the date on there, 2020. Um, and again, if there's any questions, we welcome feedback and comments. But uh, we just wish everybody a happy holidays. Thank you again for making the time today. And uh, everybody have a great day. Thank you.